Sacred Heart is proud to sponsor Pensacola Histories in recognition of the Daughters of Charity who brought their mission of care to Pensacola over 90 years ago. Hello and welcome to our continuing story of Pensacola, North America's first place city. And in this series of episodes, we've been talking about our local love affair with the automobile. In earlier episodes, we took our story all the way back to about 1900, and progressively through the teens, we've talked about what happened in the evolution of the vehicle itself, the niceties within the car itself, uh, how people dealt with their, their automobiles, what they cost, at least in, in part, and how they began to use them for well, greater distance travel. Uh, certainly, this was true before World War II. Now, we pick up today right at the end of World War II. Uh, something, of course, unique had happened by this point. We had the, the country and the Scambia County, Pensacola, had gone through 15 years of times when it was all but impossible for most people to buy an automobile. The 10 years of the Depression had limited the, the uh, available uh, funds, the capital for families to do this. And then, of course, from 1942 through 1940, the uh, middle of 1945, there uh, automobiles, the, the few that there were around were on a priority basis, and the average citizen just could not buy them. So consequently, people literally had had to take very good care of their vehicles. And you found when you got to 1945, it was not uncommon to see a good average family, particularly a farm family, that was still driving a vehicle that they had purchased back in 1930, 31, or 32. Uh, particularly of note of that, of course, was Henry Ford's Model A, which had come out uh, just before the Depression began. The Model A was a, a marvelous machine. It was uh, easy to fix, easy to care for, and people uh, uh, pat, uh, just petted them very carefully. And at the end of the war, you could see uh, a number of Model A's right here in this community. Now, something, of course, in the course of the 10-year the, the depression and the, the, uh, the war years, uh, there was a, a great, a pent-up uh, desire to buy a car. And of course, during the war, a lot of people were not able to, they couldn't spend much money for much. They were saving money for, the, for the, that day when they could get uh, a car, appliances, new clothes, and what have you. And so the, the pent-up demand for cars was great. And when the first new cars came off the production line, they looked almost exactly like the cars that had been made in 1941. Uh, this was particularly true of the big three, but they came off. And of course, the dealers were just besieged by, by armies of people who wanted the cars. And most dealers uh, who operated reputably uh, kept a very careful roster of who these people were, and people were, were treated kindly, and they, of course they got their car when their name came up on the list. And uh, by now, of course, the, the price of the cars had gone up considerably. A new car uh, purchased, let's say, at the, just before uh, Pearl Harbor, a new Chevrolet, Oh, a basic cost on this would have been about $1,500. By the time you got to 1945, that had gone up to about $1,750. And then, of course, gradually, you began to see this rise uh, rather steadily because once the war was over, there were uh, considerable increases in the cost of uh, producing steel and rubber and all of the things that went into a car. And so dealers and, and manufacturers had little choice but to escalate as well. Now, we, they didn't change much. They put a little new trim, a little, a little change here and there for the first uh, model years. And it was 1949 before cars began to change in appearance. And now we begin to see some, some physical changes as well. For example, in 1949, uh, some of the models, but GM in particular, this of course was now on the higher price cars, you began to see something that today you would think uh, we wouldn't think anything of it. It was obviously something that, that would made good sense. That was a turn signal, an automatic turn signal. You, you lifted it up left or right and uh, signaled people coming at you in any direction. Well, that had never been a part of a car before, 1949. Now it's there on some models. Also, now some, some cars begin to install uh, outside uh, safety mirrors, on the, particularly on the driver's side. Uh, previously, those mirrors had been available, but if you wanted one on your car, you went down to some auto supply store, bought one, put the screws to the screwdriver to work, and you put it on the car yourself, and that was basically the way it went. You move into the next year, then the, the year following, and by the time we get into 1951, we begin to see the automatic transmission uh, coming out on many of the cars that are uh, that are on this are being produced, particularly by General Motors and Ford. Uh, uh, Chrysler products were a little bit behind. They came up with a new form of uh, automatic transmission that for them was a, a disappointment and people didn't care for it nearly as well. We move into the early 1950s, 
And once, as at this point in time, the tremendous demand for cars had, had peaked. And <clears throat> what, what began to happen, and we certainly saw a lot of that here in Pensacola, it became a, a new kind of business. Several companies who had been used car dealers now recognized that there were some smaller dealers up in Georgia or Alabama who were being forced to take more th cars than they could sell by the manufacturers. And so Girard Motors and Garden Street Motors and Hill Kelly Motors worked out what we would call, they, they were, had deals with these small dealers up there, and they, they would bring the, they would pay maybe $100 or $200 over the manufactured uh, sales price of a car, bring it back brand new, put it on their lot down on Garden Street, and so they, uh, they became, quote, new car dealers, well, they, actually they were still used car dealers as well. Of course, the remaining uh, new car dealers were furious at this, but the, uh, the manufacturers, unfortunately for them at least, did not make any changes. We move forward through the 50s, and we see change after change after change, and now we begin to see mergers, because some of the old line manufacturers like Nash and Packard and Willis and some of the others are having trouble. They are, they're in serious competition, and uh, people, they have, they have lost favor with some of them. And of course, the, there are all sorts of modern ideas like, that have come up. Uh, several people have uh, come up with new styles that they think are going to be the, the, the nth degree. And of course, the, uh, the great shipbuilder, Henry Kaiser, was one of these. And he and a partner named Fraser came out with a, a whole new series of automobiles. This is the late uh, 50s now. They call them the, the Kaiser and the Fraser. And they even had a small version of this that they called the Henry J. And they, uh, there was a dealership for this down on, uh, on Balin Street, and they were, they were introduced, unfortunately, for the manufacturers. They did not uh, sell for long. Well, we, by the time we get into the late 1950s, another phase of motoring is beginning to change. Uh, President Eisenhower, who had been in Europe, of course, during the war, and had seen the success of the Autobahn system, which the German government had, had begun building back in the early 1930s. And Ike realized that this was a, could be a boon to the United States in many ways. And so he pushed through Congress a bill creating the, the interstate system. Now, we didn't get interstate highway uh, into Pensacola immediately. It took a good number of years. In fact, it wasn't until the gubernatorial administration of Governor Askew that we finally completed I-10 across this area. But it was coming, and there were other fine highways being built along the way as, at the same time. And of course, as you have uh, more highways and you're getting cars with, more, with greater durability, people are, are now beginning to travel farther, or at least a lot of people are. And now is when you begin to see the, the uh, advent of uh, more sophisticated uh, tourist homes, uh, places to stay, and a lot of, uh, a lot of restaurants that begin to, uh, to cater to the traveling public. And this, of course, was particularly true with, uh, with Howard Johnson's and some of those where their bright orange roofs were a very attractive sight to people who were on, on long distances. Well, also the, the coming of the cars, of course, in the, in, the, in the end of the 1950s, brought the first serious competition to American uh, manufacturers from abroad. In the late 1950s, the Volkswagen makes its appearance here. Uh, we begin to see the Mercedes cars come. Then in 1957-58, the same Girard Motors that had been selling the, the new cars as used cars uh, became our, our, our uh, engine for automobile imports. Mr. Girard worked out an arrangement with four different uh, manufacturers in France, Italy and Great Britain to bring those cars, their cars, through the port of Pensacola, and he distributed these uh, cars to uh, dealerships he had set up in six different areas, not more than about 400 miles from Pensacola. And there, the cars just flooded through the port of Pensacola, and people uh, felt that th this was going to be the wave of the future. And of course, it took about three years before the the big three in the United States came out with competitive size models. And Mr. Gerard was wise enough that he sold off his business before that happened, so that. He came out a, a rich man, and that phase of the commerce of Pensacola itself ended. Now, as these, things, these changes are coming along, people are beginning to travel in different ways. From the very first, in the, in the 19 teens and maybe just a little bit beyond that, we had such a thing as the, the trailer. This was something that a, uh, with a, a two-wheeled affair that could be hooked onto the back of an automobile and literally pulled along so that the motorist and his family could pull off into a shaded spot at night and, and live without having to go to a hotel or, or a motel. But now by the time we get into the 1960s and 70s, the, the, uh, the uh, facility for travel of that kind begins to change in a large measure, and I won't go into detail for them for you here, but you 
you can imagine that by the time we get into the 70s, all manner of new, very sophisticated uh, 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 auto trailer out of transport for the, uh, for the family is coming into being. And we are, we're seeing some of them sold here, uh, several large dealers who began in the, about that time and are in the, into the 21st century are still very, very strong and operationally here. Now, uh, as, the, as cars changed, the, the sophistication of the cars changed too. And when we pass through the, the beginnings of the space age in the 1960s, a lot of the things, a lot of the discoveries that uh, were, were promoted uh, for space travel were translatable into many other different businesses. And certainly this was true of the automobile. By the time we get into the early 1970s, we find computers being used in many facets of automobile manufacturing. I can remember one conversation I had with Frank Wells, who was at that time the president of Mulden Ford, and Frank had just been to a convention of the Ford people up in Dearborn, and he came back and he was just sort of shaking and he said, he said, I, I could not believe what I saw. But basically what is going to happen, he said, the, the man that we've trusted for years, what I call a shade tree mechanic out here on a, with a little business at the side of the road, he said he probably won't be in business in another 10 to 12 years because he won't, have the, won't be able to afford the computer diagnostic gear that will be required to work on almost any automobile. And surely what Mr. Wells came back with in the 1970s has proven to be true. There are computers in just about every phase of the automobile as you drive it today. Other things began to change to sim simple things. Whereas a, uh, uh, not too many years ago, a, every automobile tire had in, within it a, a, an inner tube. That's what held the air. Well, by the time we get into the, uh, into the 70s, we begin to see all of that changing. We have tubeless tires that come along. We have uh, tires that are called radials. Some of them are steel belted. Some of them are, are nylon belted. But nonetheless, tires begin to, uh, to be much more reliable. Uh, the, the need for the uh, average motorist to have a, a kit to, to, to uh, repair a, a, a puncture, that, that has long since disappeared. I don't think uh, I can remember anybody that I've talked to in recent years that has even changed a tire. It's, it's something the tires have become far more reliable as well. Another thing, of course, that came along with the, uh, with the, with the changing of times was the entertainment center. People began to enjoy uh, more music in their cars. They began, some, some sets even today can now can uh, come equipped with a, a television set in the back seat. Uh, with the advent of the, of the new uh, telephonic uh, equipment, uh, all sorts of things are possible as people ride along getting all, all manner of, uh, of things coming in over the radio from one stage or another so that the entertainment in the car is, is uh, so much more enjoyable than it once was. So basically, uh, as we come into the 21st century, look at the automobile. When we, when we talked about the first cars, we said, well, if a car ma managed to run for 10 or 15 or 20,000 miles, it was a remarkable piece of equipment. Today, uh, the many, most of the manufacturers today are, are providing uh, one degree or another of uh, universal maintenance for over 100,000. And it is not uncommon for families or businesses to drive their vehicles much more than that. So the reliability of the automobile, the, uh, the problems, of course, that we face today are, are different than the, the earlier people did. Now we're beginning to worry about environmental changes, the fact that the, uh, the gasoline engine is a, uh, is a contributor to air pollution. And this is something, of course, that the 21st century, well, it's going to give us another story. And if we get a chance to recreate this series in 25 years, I'm sure we'll be talking about something quite different on that. So basically, North America, and of course, particularly our own community here, we've had a, a love affair with the automobile that we can now say is about 110 years old. So many things have happened, and uh, as we mentioned in the early uh, episodes, we have, we have about 300,000 people in this, in this particular county of ours, and the number of uh, vehicles owned by uh, individuals, uh, families, and businesses, are the number is approaching that number as well. So a huge number of cars here. Uh, it is more expensive to drive one. Uh, today Today's uh, manufactured suggested price for a, for a new Chevrolet, well, it's about five times what it was 10 years ago, and it's about 20 times what it was in 1900. So basically, that's where we are. I hope you've enjoyed the idea of where our automobile came, for, kind came from, and uh, remember that the story is going to continue to change almost every day.